wish I had a good night's rest last night because it was hard work yesterday. And, but what a, what a wonderful, wonderful experience it was to, to be part of this enormous uh, gathering of, of hungry people, people that are so keen to get to know more. And then we had a host of speakers that were so keen to give and give more. And it was so satisfying and so fulfilling last night when I just sat back and enjoyed thinking about what had happened and how much value we can add, both you as delegates and us as presenters. And then, then once again, all the people that are involved with this event, from the guys on the run that, that are doing such wonderful work with the sound and the camera guys that are, that are looking after the video that is going to be the essence of, of what this event is all about. Because so much is said in little things that there's no way you're going to keep notes. And I highly recommend that you, you put away some money to buy this video uh, and, and study it in depth in time to come. Then, of course, we need to think of Lusa, the guys that from the community chest that have worked for a year to put this together, Veronica and Thanu and her team, the people at the registration table, and then, of course, Emeralds, the jewel of the Val, that have invested so much in this community and are willing to feed us and host us in this, ev in this event. And it's a, huge, it's a huge event. I can just imagine next year we're going to have 700, 750, maybe even 800 people in this event. And how much value and how much good is going to come from that. So welcome back here this morning, everybody. Who was not here yesterday? Who was not? So many not here yesterday. Then I must reintroduce myself. My name is Malungu Metcalf, Peter Metcalf, Madala Metcalf. Hmm? But I can't go through the entire presentation, but I'm just going to quickly just tell you that I head up an organization called the Foundation for the Development of Africa. And if you want to know more about me and what I do, you can Twitter me. Twitter, you know Twitter, and my Twitter address is at Viva Africa, Viva, Viva Africa, huh? Viva. So you can Twitter me at Viva Africa, or you can Google me, Peter Metcalf with an E, Peter Metcalf, and I guarantee you I'm number one in the world. One, who no. And then you'll find out more about what I do and who I am and why I do this and why I don't do that. And you may recall yesterday I said it's vital that you have a presence on Facebook and all these social media networks because that's where you start if you want to really make an impression. Because you've got to be somewhere if you want to go anywhere. And remember I used the example yesterday of a tape measure. You need to know where you are before you can move forward. How's now, yesterday. What happened yesterday? For those of you who weren't here yesterday. First, yesterday, we had a number of presentations, and the issue that came out of the presentation that let's be honest in our business ventures. Let's be ethical. And you may recall that Eric, the, the wimpy man, Eric came forward by saying, be big, be humongous in your thinking, in what you want to do. Be brave in what you want to do. And if you want to achieve something, go for it. But don't be sidetracked. Hold the vision and keep that vision. But don't see other opportunities as you go towards your vision because you're going to get sidetracked off what you really want to do. Then you will, you, within the business ethics, we touched on a number of issues on how it's going to impact on your business. And you'll see today that when we go through the, 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 the various presentations that we're going to do on how the, the principles of doing good business manage to keep these people on top. We touched in, on an issue yesterday regarding labor. And you remember I asked the, the panel what would they do and how would they approach Valvi? You know Valvi, Mr. Valvi from Kasatu? And very interesting this morning 
on TV, there was a whole issue around the, eco economic, the, the country's economic uh, situation. Are we doing, are we growing, are we dying, are, what's happening? And how, how's Labour seeing this and how's Labour interacting with this? And a very interesting comment came out this morning to say that we must realize that Labour is a commodity. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you as a laborer is a commodity. I'm saying the, the noun labor is a commodity. And if, if, my, if the commodity becomes too expensive, I won't buy it. I'll look for something else. And if we understand that, then we're saying, hey, are we on the right track? Where are we going? And it's costing us dearly. So what is happening if... If the commodity that I'm looking for is labor and it's too expensive, I'll go to another country where it's cheaper. Okay, if I'm an investor. And then I gave you homework yesterday afternoon and I said, I want you to think about how do people perceive you? Would, would you, if you had to come to me now and say, I want you to invest in me, my company, would I give you the money? On what I see and I'm not saying that are you best dressed and are you smartly dressed but it's how you approach it have you been trained in how to talk to people on how to approach people or are you dodgy and you checking out the scene and you understand where I'm going or are you brave and saying I will I will give you the best return on your investment because I can and I will because I'm big and I will make you big. Happy with that? And then I said, surround yourself with people that make you look good. Hmm? And on the stage with me, I've got somebody that is making me real, look real good. Ladies and gentlemen, the program today is unchanged, except for one small item. The lucky draw, the lucky draw after lunch, will take place after the panel discussion. All right. Because I know that if we do the lucky draw and you get your prizes, you're going to go home. And I want you to stay here. So I'm saying no prizes until after the panel discussion. And we had fun yesterday with the panel discussion. So we're going to have more fun today. So you know that yesterday we had no woman speaking. Hmm? And it's Women's Month. But today we've got two women speaking. And the two women are on the panel. Let's give the woman a big hand. Viva the woman. So, and then our, our uh, Matthew Tebakang is going to do, do a poetry retage, a redemption for us. But we're going to do that in between the two speakers this morning. All right. So just be patient with me like that. Ladies and gentlemen, the new Edith Fenter decided in 2010 that it was time to rebrand and called it Edith Unlimited. And she actually refu re refers to this, the tagline along this Edith Unlimited as expect the unexpected. Isn't that a nice phrase? And I can tell you something. I've met Edith a number of times on podiums before and you can expect the unexpected. But a, a lustrous CV, and in 1999, Edith Fenter traded in her social uh, engagements, if I can call it that, and her obligations as an executive wife uh, to, uh, for a laptop, she says. And she took business world, the business world by storm. She was born and bred in Gauteng, but then moved to London and then returned back to, to South Africa and became the wife of the late Dr. Bill Fenter, and I'm sure you're familiar with the legend of, of uh, Bill Fenter. Long supported many, many charity organizations, and I'm not going to go through the huge list, but one of them that caught my attention was the SA Guide Dog Association, and obviously now, as you well know, uh, Edith spends a lot of time in Cancer Association, and she received numerous awards around that and also recently made a two million rand donation for, for, with work that she inst instigated and, and projects that she instigated for the Cancer Association. So extremely, extremely proactive in this field. But 
having moved in these vast uh, uh, highlight or high society circles and, and counting the local and international diplomats and industrial magnates and politicians as, as friends, Edith remained tremendous, uh, uh, remains tremendous in demand for social events and continues to grace society pages with her flawless beauty and undeniable style. When she walks in anywhere, you know she's there. She's just got something that makes her special. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the radiant one and only Edith Fenter. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, I was, I was very, I had to smile because he said I was married to the late Dr. Fenter. <laughs> Sometimes I wish he was, but he isn't late. <laughs> He's still around. No, it's very special, and he um, was very important in my life as I was going through uh, all the things that I did and when I started my business. Because, in fact, he was one of my biggest mentors as far as business was concerned. Because I had the privilege of really learning from the best. Can you? You can't see me there, can you? But anyway, I'm here. I'm just going to chat to you today because it's always an honor to be invited to address an audience such as this, and especially one relating to small and medium business entrepreneurs, because that's where I am. And I was listening, it does take a lot of courage and a lot of faith to make that leap of faith and to do something that you're in charge of. Um, it means you're not belonging to a huge corporate where you go and and draw your paycheck at the end of the month, you've actually got to create your paycheck. And that's a lot of hard, hard work. So I always admire small and medium business entrepreneurs. And from that, of course, you can become very, very great. And we're going to talk about some of those ones later on. So bear with me as I run through how, where I started. I definitely consider myself as an entrepreneur. I'm not quite sure in what category, but I'm there. And I speak to many audiences such as this, and I get asked to mentor many young people that are starting out as to how they go about it and, and what they need to do. Growing up, I grew up in Edenville, close to Oliver Tambo Airport, many, many, many years ago family of six children and went to the Holy Rosary convent there and I mean that was my life. Amazing parents who gave us wonderful foundation and grounding, a, a great education which I bless them for to this day and that was what I knew. That was my role model. It was very special, a very special uh, growing up experience. Not much money or anything like that, but lots and lots of love and lots and lots of support that I had from my parents. So I think they were very instrumental in creating my need to discover more in my life because I always knew I wasn't going to stay in Edenville. I was going to get up and out there and go and explore that world. And I certainly did. And I'm very fortunate to have done that. How I started my business and Edith Venter Promotions, as it was first known, was because I have two very beautiful sons. They're now 30 and 28. They're young men and in business themselves. And I was a mom. I was a stay-at-home mom. I was fortunate enough to be that. I know many women and cannot do that these days. They've got to get out and go and work as well. Um, and and so be it, that's the way of our world today. But I was fortunate, I was a stay-at-home mom, sort of was with my kids when they went to school, did all of those sorts of things. But as they were growing up, I realized that at some point they were gonna leave, they were gonna go off to university or do whatever they were gonna do. And what was I gonna do? Because I had invested so much time in them. I had already started my work with charity organizations, I had become the patron of the Cancer Association, of which I'm very proud, and I did a lot of work for them. But I knew I wanted to do more. I wanted to wake up in the morning and say, 
That's me. I'm achieving that, apart from my work with charity. So one morning I woke up, I looked at myself, and I thought, any minute now they're going to take off, and I need to be doing something. And the best way to start, and I think, I'm sure when you look at your stories, it's very similar. I woke up one morning, I thought, what am I good at? Now remember, I hadn't been in the working field at that stage for about 20 something years. And I had left the working world when there were still things like telex machines and strange instruments like that, and you're all far too young to even remember those days. But there were no computers, there weren't anything when I left the working world. And so, 20 years later, I stood up and I said, well, what are you good at? You need to look at what you're good at, what you enjoy. And I thought, I love people. I interact with people all the time. And I thought, well, what else do you do? What can you offer? What can you give as a business? And I know that through, with my marriage to Bill Fenter, I had been involved with the company, um, organizing many of the events within the, the organization. And I thought, well, you know what? I go to a lot of parties, and I can throw a hell of a good party. So maybe that's a good place to start. Events sounds like a good idea. And I had a young friend who said, come on, Edith, you need to do this. You should do this, because that's very much your style. So I thought, OK, so events, I like people. I can interact with people. So maybe let's start this events company and see what happens. And so Edith Fenter Promotions was born. And if I look back, it was a very humble beginning. I was so naive. <laughs> I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. And I thought, you know what? We're going to try it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But if I don't try, I'm never going to, to know whether I'm going to be a success or not. So we, Edith Fenter Promotions was born. And um, I then found out that, in fact, a lot of, of, of your success is not what you know, it's who you know, as far as I was concerned. Because at my launch party, I had this wonderful launch party, still didn't quite know what I was doing. And I was approached by Egoli, which was the big soap opera at that stage, and has now shut down. But they said they're doing their 2000th episode and they want to do a big ball. And they said to me, if you can find the sponsorship, you can do the ball. And me and my naivety said, oh, that's no problem. How much do you want? This was many years ago. This was like 12 years ago. Um, and they said, uh, we need one and a half million rand as a sponsorship to really make this very special because we want 2,000 guests and that's it. And I said, no problem, I'm going to phone MTN. And they said, no, don't bother, we've already gone there. So I said, yes, but maybe you haven't gone to the right person. And I had a very good contact at MTN. And I phoned him and I said, this is what we want to do. This is the benefits. I'm sure we can, MT, uh, Mnet are involved, obviously, through the channel. And I think there's a wonderful marriage here. And this gentleman said, no problem. Didn't, we never signed a thing. That was what was so wonderful about business then. Never signed a thing. He said, you've got your sponsorship. I was so excited. I couldn't believe my luck. Phoned up, um, uh, phoned up Egoli, Birchett Miller, and I said, I've got the sponsorship. When can we start planning the ball? And he said, I don't believe it. So I said, better believe it. It was my very first function, 2,000 people. And I remember that night standing on the steps of Gallagher because that was the only venue big enough. And all these waves of people arriving. And I thought, what have I done? It's a, is this gonna, what's going to happen tonight? And I wanted to run away. But I thought, this is baptism by fire. To this day, people still talk about that ball. And it was a great success. So that was my leap of faith. That was how I started. And from saying to myself, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. We've never had to advertise. We've never had to look for business. It's just automatically come to us. And we're very blessed for that. <clears throat> Within Edith Venter Unlimited, well, Edith Venter Promotions and Edith Unlimited now, there's only two of us in our company. I know sometimes the things that we do look like we, we have many, many people working for us, but we don't. There's two of us, two women, and then we use our suppliers. And of course, that's 
very, very um, important to my line of business that, is that my suppliers are very reliable and do what they say they're going to do. Because that, as a team, we then make it a, whatever we're doing a big success. A lot of what we do also raises money for charity organizations. And there's many. And in fact, I know Peter mentioned the SA Guide Dogs. We're planning their 11th annual ball next month. So um, it's something that's grown. And I think we've raised over 5 million rand for them to date. So I love doing what I do. And I always say you need to be very passionate about what it is that you do. Because if you aren't, you're not going to be happy on a day-to-day -day basis or or give of your best. So even though we don't get a lot of sleep, a lot of what we do is over weekends or at nights. Um, and But I love it. I love that seeing that my hard work, in fact, raises money for very needy causes and we're able to give back to society. I've never had formal training for what I'm doing. I know now there are courses, there's university technicon courses, colleges where you can study marketing, PR, eventing, and all of those good things. I myself have never had any formal training. And we're gonna talk about some very great entrepreneurs later on who have also not had formal training, or in fact have actually dropped out of school. Not that I'm saying that's what you should be doing, because in fact, these days, the more knowledge you can, you can get, the better it is, and the better it's gonna stand you in good stead. And also, we, are, we, are, um, we have laws of governance as well, which are very important, and I know other speakers will speak to you about that, but we have to comply with tax, VAT, and all of those things, and, and CIPROs, and the way we register our companies, and the way we run our businesses. So that's very important that you know all about that as well. What, I, what I've achieved, I've achieved much, and I'm very proud of it. And, and just having that courage of my convictions has allowed me to do that. I want to touch on something, having built up my business and my reputation and my name, which is very, very important to me, and what we do and, the, and being ethical about the way we do it. It got to a point a couple of years ago where I felt we needed to expand. And at that stage, the BEE was, had come into place and was very strictly adhered to. And of course, I was a, a very small little business. Now things have changed, and the, the way of rating businesses has changed complete, completely. So now we are B, uh, BEE compliant for big corporates, of which we have some great clients, such as Discovery and Unilever and Avis, etc. But at that stage, I wasn't. And I thought, in order to grow and be able to get those, those, those big functions and those events, I needed to take on a BEE uh, partner or, or, or something to that effect, which would make me compliant. And because I've always dealt with, and like I said, I, I do huge things on the handshake uh, with people, and I've always conducted my, my, if I promise to do something for people, that's what they get. And, and whether it kills me or not, I stick to what I've promised. And so in my naivety a little, I expect people to, to behave the same. Of course, not everyone does. And I spoke to somebody, and it sounded all wonderful. And he said, come on, join with me, and we will merge, and um, we'll get it. Because it, you will then be BEE, and you will be able to go ahead and do all of the things that you want to do. I did. Uh, he gave me a, a, a contract, um, a document, and I sort of glanced through it, signed it, uh, and thought what I had heard was good enough for me, and I was excited. I just wanted to move forward, grow my business, and, and get on with work. And of course, it didn't happen like that. Unfortunately, very quickly, I realized that things were not as what they seemed. I really didn't want to... Um, uh, associate my name with a situation like that, and I wasn't happy at all. 
uh, one thing led to another and I walked away from it and I said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to carry on with this. I'm going to rather retract. And it was very soon, so it, it, we hadn't gone any sort of distance down the line. And I said, you know, I'm just going to go back and do what I did before. I think that's better. I'm more in control and let's just get on with it. Of course, this contract I had signed, there were clauses. So one morning I woke up and I had an interdict served on me to say I couldn't do what I did, I couldn't use my name, and I couldn't approach any of my clients, which after 25 years of being in business and having those, I mean, the, my clients were my friends, um, and a lot of what I did, remember, goes to help charities, and I said, how can you stop me raising money for charities? I mean, that's... That sounds criminal to me, and the law is the law, and I was foolish, and why I'm telling you this is you are all in businesses, you run your own small businesses, you need to be aware of what you sign, what you promised, what's promised, what's promised to you. Um, just my, my, my biggest thing that I can offer you today is to be very, very careful. Get legal advice if you need to. Make sure before you sign that there isn't something there that can turn around and bite you later on. And I know after I had done it and I had paid the price because at the end of the day it was all about money. So I said to my husband, I've been kidnapped. It's like I've been kidnapped. We need to pay a ransom here. I need to get my identity.